Hello everyone and welcome to this new video. Today I'm talking to Sean from Righteous Weasel Game. Um, Sean, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, I'm Sean Garland. Uh, like you said, I'm from uh, Righteous Weasel Games. I'm the lead developer on the projects we have over there. In a nutshell, what kind of game are we talking to uh, about today? Um, so, Eternal Edge is an action-adventure role-playing game. Uh, where you kind of just, uh, it's an open world experience. Um, it's got a little bit of story, uh, <laughs> but it's more fi uh, focused on the adventure aspect. So you'll be exploring the world, uh, questing, um, leveling up, so on and so forth, and gearing up your character so that you can defeat the main bad guy. <laughs> Why did you choose to make a game like this? Um... Mostly because of my favorite genres, I would say. Uh, I love adventure games. I love RPGs in general. So um, action RPGs specifically, I have a big fondness for. Games like uh, The Legend of Zelda, which are not really RPGs, but they are open world exploration. I do love uh, that kind of experience. So uh, that would be the main reason, I would say. Did the game become what you originally planned it to become before the start of development? Uh, not at all, actually. <laughs> um, it originally started as like a, a top-down uh, adventure game, more like uh, the original Zeldas, I would say. Like uh, if you ever played any of the 3DS Zelda, um, A Link Between Worlds, it was more like a game like that. Um, but over development, um, I would be experimenting with different features and stuff, and I'd be like, oh, that's really cool. So I'd add it in, and then I'd find something else and be like, oh, that's really cool. And so I'd add that in. Um, and then eventually, I played Breath of the Wild, which was a massive mistake because it's an incredible game. And um, then I was like, oh, well, I have to make it 3D open world. <laughs> so, so then that happened. Um, but yeah, it, it definitely <clears throat> evolved over the course of development. And the game is already out, or are you still developing? Yeah, so uh, a little bit of both. Um, it came out on the Switch in North America, the Nintendo Switch, um, mostly because uh, we got approval to release it. Um, but the caveat to that was they required it to be released within three months of getting approval. So even though it was still under development, I really wanted to have it out on the Switch. So. Um, I pushed development forward in order to get that to happen. Um, but again, it only came out in North America on the Nintendo Switch. Um, and now I'm continuing to develop it for the Xbox, um, the PC, and the other regions of the Switch. Uh, and so the new version, which I'm calling Ultimate Edition, is the final whole game. Um, the original release wasn't quite what I wanted. Um, again, I just had to kind of push it out in order to get that approval. From Nintendo. Why only North America and not Europe? Um, so originally I didn't have um, the ability to release in Europe just because of translations. The translations were still being worked on so by the time it was time to uh, get the game published we didn't have any of the translations done. Uh, so it just came out in North America. What inspired you to become an indie game developer? Um, just my love for video games, I would say. <laughs> it's what I wanted to do when I was a kid growing up, so that's just what happened. Is this your first game? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> I'm counting it as my first official game. Um, but I brought out a game called 8-Bit Hero on the Wii U uh, while I was still in college. So it was kind of like a side project. When I get home from class, I'd mess around with it a little bit. And then eventually I got it to the point where it was done. Um, so I published it on the Wii U. What platforms do you intend to release this game? Um, so uh, it should be on Steam. Um, so PC, uh, Xbox One, Nintendo Switch and the other regions. Um, and then also I'm hoping for PS4 as well, but that's TBD. What do you think is your best attitude in life? Ah, <sighs> that's a really good question. Um, keeping going. You ever heard like Nike, like just do it? Yeah, just do it. That's the best you could do. <laughs> 
Okay. <laughs> For how long have you been working on this project? Uh, so this one, um, I'm not going to include the last few months because I've had a, a, a bit of a slow period of development over the last three months, I would say. Uh, probably about a year. Started uh, last year in May, I would say. Last year in May. And then um, I worked full time on it for about five months. And then I had to take a little bit of time off. Um, but yeah, probably about a year. What was your day to day process while you developed this game? Um, so most of the time, when I, especially when I was working full time on it, uh, it was basically I would. Uh, wake up, make sure I had my coffee, and I'd get right to work. Uh, I'd get up at about 7, um, and I'd work the full day until 8 or 9 p.m. at least. Sometimes I'd go later, but uh, sometimes I'd get too tired. <laughs> so it was lots of coffee. Um, and then uh, on those days I would stay up late, I would just make sure that I always uh, had the right amount of sleep so that I could get up early the next day and continue to work. What will happen if you don't have coffee? <laughs> Bad things, bad things. <laughs> will your day-to-day -day process be the same for potential future games you will make? Uh, yes, um, as far as the work ethic is concerned and the initial planning period is concerned, yes, it will be the same. Um, but sticking to the script is really important, I found. And I already knew this, but you really have to hammer it in yourself by messing up, I think. <laughs> um, because people will tell you, oh, you know, stick to the script. Like, if once you decide something, do it, you know. But you as a developer, or, you know, most people as developers, I think indie developers, um, you're not going to understand it unless you really experience it. So um, this time I strayed too far from the original setup of the game, and I just made it take longer. Um, so I will just make sure that whatever I decide to make next time, I will just stick to the original design. Of course, like with a little bit of leeway, right? So you will always want to make the project better. So um, little pieces here and there, like certain features, can always be improved based on testing and development and blah, blah, blah. Um, but the original design should always stay somewhat the same. What were your biggest inspirations for making this game? Um, well, I would say the slight success of my last game on the Wii U. Um, being like, oh, hey, I really can do this. I really could potentially support myself and other people um, making these games. So that was a big thing. Um, and then also just, again, like, uh, I just love, uh, you know, the game industry. I love, you know, Nintendo games specifically. So that kind of stuff. And wanting to make those and wanting to create those uh, is a big thing. What makes this game different from others? Uh, I would say mostly the exploration factor. Um, so it is kind of like your typical uh, action-adventure RPG, right? But uh, you actually level up by exploring versus leveling up by, you know, defeating mobs and stuff. Um, you do level up by um, completing quests and blah, 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 but you're really rewarded for exploring um, the far corners of the world. <laughs> so um, when you find an area that you hadn't found before, you'll get rewarded um, with level ups and uh, other things like that. So that's probably the most unique part where it's, um, I mean, most games, they kind of push you to explore because you'll get experience and blah, blah, blah. Um, but you literally will find level ups as you're exploring in chests. Um, so that kind of pushes you to explore a little bit more. Um, there's also like a slight kind of simple equipment upgrade systems that kind of keep you going as well. Um, these are all being improved in the uh, new Ultimate Edition as well, but uh, things like you can combine weapons that you have multiple of and uh, level the weapons up as well. So if you have a particular weapon that you really like and you find multiple of them, you can combine them together in order to level it up. What makes this game different from others? Um, that's a really good question. <laughs> It is, uh, again, pretty typical uh, action role uh, RPG. But 
the fact that it is so focused on the exploration is probably the most unique piece about it. Um, there's also uh, an open world multiplayer mode, which is not like most multiplayers you go find. Um, so again, it's also improved upon in the new Ultimate Edition, but you can actually play with up to four people on the same screen. Um, and the new version as well, you'll be able to uh, level them up and you know uh, choose their equipment and so on and so forth, which you weren't able to do in the previous version. What do you think is the most interesting part of the game? Um, probably the uh, art style uh, and the mostly the art style. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's actually a very interesting mix of kind of voxelized and uh, organic. It uh, definitely developed a lot over the course of uh, production. Uh, so originally we had a full voxel, 100% voxel. Everything was cubes. Um, so it was almost like 30 pixels, right? Um, but that had to kind of change over time as we started testing on different consoles. So uh, systems like Xbox and obviously uh, PC and PS4 were pretty much fine with the high fidelity uh, pixelated geometry. Um, but once we got it onto the Switch, it really couldn't handle it all that well. So we had to do a lot of adjustments. And um, so we started adding in uh, terrain um, and different types of foliage that weren't so uh, high fidelity. Because uh, as simple as polygon geometry looks, like as simple as uh, pixelated geometry looks, rather, it's actually really expensive to use. So it might look cool, but it's way more expensive than making like a realistic looking tree. Uh, so we had to find like a nice um, medium and merge between the two. What game engine are you using and why did you decide to work with this one? So we're using uh, Unity Engine. Um, Originally, I started using Unity uh, because it was the only option to um, back when I was doing Wii U development. Um, so I was kind of stuck with it for a while, and I wanted to originally use Unreal, but again, because Wii U required Unity, uh, that's what I was using. And then I just grew to love it so much because I used it a lot. <laughs> um, so by the time we got to the next project, I just stuck with Unity, and I've been using it ever since. What setbacks did you encounter during the project, and do you feel like you learned anything from them? Uh, so major setbacks would be like um, platform porting, um, support on the different platforms like Xbox and uh, Switch. Um, they can handle very different things. So the Switch is actually pretty powerful. It is. It's a strong little box. <laughs> um, but there's definitely things it doesn't like specifically. Um, whereas like if you're developing on the Xbox, it kind of doesn't really care what you throw at it. As long as you don't hit the peak numbers, it's going to be fine. Um, things like on the Xbox, I could run, you know, 2 million polygons, and uh, it would just be running at 60 frames per second and not even care. Um, but on the Switch, I found that with certain post-processing effects and blah, 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 developer lingo, um, you know, I could only hit like 120,000 without it dipping in frame rate. So it's just the uh, different uh, caveats and different platforms that you really have to deal with. So um, specifically when we started porting it to the Switch um, because of the timeline, we really had to cut back on uh, geometry and special effects and that kind of thing. And that was uh, the, the game took a big hit at that point because we weren't prepared for it. So definitely um, researching beforehand, even if you think it's going to happen a year from now, what certain platforms require is very important. If you could go back in time, what would you do different? Mm. I would stick to the original script. <laughs> um, I would uh, make the game that I had originally planned. Um, so on my team, there's actually uh, two or three three of us, uh, it, it kind of changes between uh, months who's working on it. But uh, mostly it's uh, two of my brothers and then another one of my friends. And we work on it together. Um, 
But uh, one of my brothers specifically, he gets really into the development. He'll be like, oh, we should add this, we should add this, and we should add this. And, and uh, when I'm with him, I kind of go along with it. I'm like, yeah, that sounds great. Uh, <laughs> so things just start to get really out of hand. Um, <clears throat> so just making sure uh, that he and I always stick with uh, what we had originally planned is very important. If you can as far as a new indie game developer, what would you tell him? Um, you know, that's a good question. I don't want to sound like I'm beating a dead horse, but really just thinking up what you want to create and sticking with it is honestly the most important thing. I mean, after, I mean, I've only been working on it for a year, but it's been over the span of more like a year and a half. Um, seeing that is really, really important. Uh, so yeah, definitely just sticking with what you <clears throat> had originally planned uh, is the biggest thing, for sure. What do you feel is success for an indie game developer? Uh, using Twitter very well. <laughs> no, but more seriously, um, yeah, uh, using uh, social media is very important. Uh, even if your game isn't the best thing uh, in the world, you can still get a pretty solid following group if you use social media right. Um, I've seen a lot of indie developers who have games that I'm like, wow, I can't believe that you have as many like um, sales and whatever as you do, but it's really because they have just such a really good uh, social media campaign. So that's one thing. Again, also just having a fun game. Um, doesn't really matter in this day and age what the game looks like, um, as long as it's fun to play. So again, there's different markets for people. Um, some people, they just want to look at the graphics. Some people just want to hear the music. But the biggest one, I, should, I would say, is just as long as it's fun, people will like it. So if you have good, uh, good uh, marketing, it's free marketing, social media. Most of it's free, right? Um, good social media and just a good, clean experience. Again, it doesn't have to be the best thing in the world. You're probably going to be pretty successful. Um, and then pushing for those things that you don't really think could happen. Like, I never thought I would be developing on consoles, but when I just asked Nintendo about it, they kind of just let me do it. So um, if you have something that looks clean, um, looks commercial, again, even if it's not the best thing in the world, and you ask one of these big companies if you can develop for them, they, they just might let you. Um, so just kind of shooting for your dreams, really shooting for what you want to get done, and it might just happen. To make other game developers learn something, what resources would you recommend? Um, so Unity specifically, um, if they wanted to get into that and they're new to it, um, following the intro Unity tutorials is really important it's it's really really important even when um, jumping into unity for me i was already a programmer i mean i went to school i was a software engineer right um but jumping into unity without that was just a pain so um those uh tutorials that they have built into their website are really important really good resources um other thing i would say is uh if maybe you're not a good 3D modeler, but you want to make a 3D game, hold off. Um, if you're really getting into it to the start, you're probably going to have to do everything yourself. You're probably going to have to make the music. You're probably going to have to uh, make the art, blah, blah, blah. You can't find everything online, even though you can. Um, the asset store has a lot of stuff. But um, just get into your discomfort zone. Um, so maybe make a pixel art game instead of a 3D game and make all the pixel art yourself. Um, just using some simple uh, 2D art programs. Um, but you'll actually learn a lot because if you start making the art yourself, you'll learn what does it mean to have assets that you can use. And that's really important when you start hiring artists later on. You need to be able to tell them exactly what you need and why you need it that way because there's specific things that engines can and can't use and there's reasons that you need to know um, in order to effectively convey that to your team. So it's really important to at least get your hands dirty a little bit in those um, places, not just in programming, because um, otherwise when it comes to parts of the game where you start hiring artists and um, modelers and blah, 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 your game's just not going to work because 
they didn't know that you needed certain pieces um, in, in ways that, you know, they didn't know about. So knowing <clears throat> all of the pipeline, all of the development pipeline is really, really important. And again, you can start very easily just with making like a, you know, old school pixel art style game and you can learn a lot on the way. What do you think about the current marketing strategies in the indie game industry? Uh, marketing strategies? Yeah. Um, it's interesting. <laughs> it's interesting. We rely a lot on social media, um, which is great because it lets pretty much anyone jump out there and, and get, uh, get their stuff visible. Um, but at the same time, it makes it really hard for somebody, even if they might have something that's incredible. They might have, uh, you know, uh, a product that's just, I don't know, it's, it's awesome. Um, but if they don't know how to use the social media right, or they don't know people who know how to use it right, they can just get buried and their, their stuff will never be found. Again, if you have something truly incredible, if you show it to enough people, it's bound to be found out. But um, it's, uh, it's an interesting mix of do you yourself want to learn how to use the media properly or do you want to find somebody who can do that for you? Um, and then if you yourself are going to do it, you have to understand how much time that's going to take out of your development um, just going through um, and trying to do uh, publicity for your game. So it's rough. Where do you see the indie game market going in a few years? Um, I think that it's going to start to get a little bit more, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Mm. Not cycled. Sifted? Sifted through? Yeah, something like that. Um, I think that there's going to be a lot more barriers soon, probably in the next few years, uh, stopping like really, really, really tiny developers from just spitting out a whole lot of content. Um, that's kind of what it is right now, like especially in Steam. All you have to do is pay $100, and then you can pretty much publish whatever you want. So I think in the next few years, people are going to have had, um, they're going to be fed up with that because they don't know where the good content is. They're going to have a really hard time. So I think that a lot more walls are going to start to form, and they're going to start to bar people from just publishing whatever they want. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see where that goes. Which indie game developers, if any, offered you any support or knowledge in creating this game? Um, I wouldn't say I had any direct contact with other indie developers uh, in that regard, but I did have a lot of um, indie games that I really enjoyed um, when I was going through development that kind of pushed me to keep going because I saw um, how successful they were and so on and so forth. Like uh, the Banner Saga, Banner, Banner Saga, I'm sorry. Um, I love the Fire Emblem series, so when I was playing that game, I was like, oh, this is really cool. Um, other games like Axiom Verge, um, stuff like that. Uh, they're just all really cool, fun games that I think are awesome that they were made by such small teams. So um, they just kind of kept me going, I would say. Is there a triple A studio you would work for if you could? <laughs> uh, Nintendo. <laughs> Lucky That's, people uh... at Nintendo. <laughs> <laughs> Which game that can be either indie or triple A do you wish you had worked on? Hmm. That's a good question. Um I don't know. Breath of the Wild. Uh any of the Metroid games. That's pretty much that. Yeah. Have you ever worked for other gaming companies? What's that? Have you ever worked for other gaming companies? Uh, not specifically, no. Um, I worked for uh, small studios that do like contract work, but not specifically for like a game company, no. Did you have any gaming education at school, or did you learn the whole development process on your own? 
<laughs> yeah, my schooling was all gaming. <laughs> um, uh, so I learned most uh, basic game programming just by myself when I was at home before I went to college. Um, when I was in high school, especially, I did a lot of like drag and drop programming with Game Maker and like programs like that, just because I really wanted to get into it. Um, but then when I got to college, I really wanted to do games. So I actually went to Full Sail and I got a game development degree, which at the time was more like a software engineering degree. And while I was there, they actually added a software engineer degree, but all of those students were in all of our classes. And then the new game development degree was a few months behind us and they were veering off to do other stuff. So I had basically a software engineer degree, which is wrapped in a wrapper called game development. Um, but it was mostly focused on games, which was awesome. Um, so we learned a lot about building engines um, and then uh, just how you would handle the whole pipeline, um, stuff like that. So it was great. Where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in South Florida in the United States of America. So that was interesting. It's pretty much all flat, big swamp. It looks beautiful in pictures because the beaches are beautiful. But once you leave the beach, it's, uh, it's just a big swamp with a lot of alligators and snakes. So it's not that exciting. You, you make it sound like a terrible place. And it's you scary, never go honestly. There. <laughs> honestly, it's actually really scary. If you come here for vacation, it's fine. You know, again, go to the beach, go to Disney World. Um, but if you explore, uh, you will get into the jungle. And it's, uh, it's a scary, scary place. We have boa constrictors, pythons, um, boars, alligators, crocodiles, uh, any kind of uh, coral snakes, poison. I mean, it's a... It's a it's a scary, scary place. <laughs> I am so lucky where, um, living in a country where the biggest wildlife thing you find in a normal village is a hedgehog. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> what were your childhood interests? Uh, childhood interests? Um, yeah, video games. Love Zelda. He was my, he was my childhood hero, you know. Uh, Link, not Zelda. <laughs> he, um, but uh yeah i played a lot of that i made uh any drawings you see from my childhood or of like gaming magazines mostly because my older brothers would have gaming magazines so i'd like flip through them and then i try to like recreate them with my own games that i drew into them um so that was a big thing um and i really like pokemon cards so <laughs> pokemon cards were awesome i like them too yeah <laughs> yep. what is your favorite video game of all time um can i say like a whole series because sure. you already know the answer to that but uh, i mean the zelda series right uh <laughs> also most of the metroid games they're kind of they're kind of uh fighting each other for the top spot well it's a good top two what is your favorite video game of this year and why mm, dragon quest 11 yeah um, I haven't played a lot of games this year, honestly, but uh, I recently picked up Dragon Quest XI, and I was just really, really happily surprised. Um, I was not expecting much, but then I started playing, and I was like, wow, this is actually an awesome game. I mean, the story's awesome, music's great, uh, gameplay is just clean, and I'm, I'm very a lazy gamer. I like competitive gaming, but if I'm not doing a competitive game and it's one player... Um, I just want to like sit there and watch the graphics, so this was perfect for that. <laughs> um, because the gameplay is not too involved, but it's just involved enough to where you really get to decide what your characters are going to do, um, as far as like what class they're going to be and uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, but yeah, I, I just love that game; it's fantastic. I am out of questions. Do you have other stuff you want to say? Um. No, I, I think that's pretty much it. Um, as far as for other indie developers, I would say, <clears throat> yeah, just do it. As far as um, you know, what you want to get done, if you want to make something, in the end of the day, you're the one that has to make it. So um, if you've got an idea in the back of the head, uh, in the back of your head, you have to make it happen. So just sitting down and finding the time, even if it's after work or in between jobs. Um, you know, a lot of people have. Um, the dream of making this stuff, but they just don't necessarily have the time. And it's just making that time um, and just getting done what you want to get done, because that's how you're going to get to where you want to be. 
Okay, um, I want to thank you for your time, uh, for the viewers, all the links to, to the game and the social media for the game are in the description below. Cool.